everyone. You're listening to the first ever podcast. I'm Jesse Marks, associate editor at Voice of San Diego, and I write about cannabis and politics. I'm here with our engagement editor, Kinsey Moreland, who covers arts and culture. Hey, guys. So uh, the podcast will be a semi-regular podcast about cannabis that we're just going to start by dropping it into the Voice of San Diego weekly feed. Um, you know, it's new, so we're we're going to appreciate any feedback and topic ideas. So uh, hit us up if you've got them. Our goal with this podcast is to make the brave new world of cannabis accessible to the average person. Uh, whether you like it or not, cannabis is here to stay, and it is going to alter our region in so many ways. Some known, some not so much. So we want you to help us navigate that Email us with ideas. Email jesse at j-e-s-s-e at v-o-s-d dot org. So um, let's start the show with uh, with everything in mind that's going on. I, I, I think we should start uh, by explaining to those who are new to this topic that cannabis regulations vary pretty widely from one city and county to another in California. And that's actually by design. Proposition 64 allowed people to grow up to six plants. Uh, for their personal use. It also allowed them to possess up to an ounce of cannabis products. But at the same time, it gave municipalities the option to ban commercial operations, which helps explain some of the confusion that may be out there. San Diego was one of the first major cities in the state, and indeed the first city in the county, to lay out a regulatory system, not only for retailers, but growers, distributors, manufacturers, uh, as well as testers. Uh, But there's one element of the supply chain that has been kept out of that conversation, and that is the independent deliverers. In San Diego, only licensed retail shops can make house calls. That means the hundreds of independent drivers who had previously operated in a bit of a gray area of the law, uh, they were forced on January 1st to either close shop or merge with retailers, if they were lucky enough, or go underground. So to help us break this situation down, we're joined by Sam Hamid, member of the uh, San Diego Cannabis Delivery Alliance, who's been educating local drivers on the patchwork of regional regulations while doing some lobbying um, on his own and for his group. Thanks for thanks for joining us, Sam. Yeah, it's good to be here. Thanks. And I should also say Sam is the founder of Flame and Leaf, a home consultation company. Is that still the case? That is still the case. Um, thanks for coming down from Oceanside, right? Correct. All right. We appreciate it. Let's. Um, so let's start. Uh, b- before moving down here to this area, Sam, I and correct me if I'm wrong, but it's my understanding that you had operated one of the first medical dispensaries up in Los Angeles, and Ye- you did so for about a decade? That's correct. So in 2006, I founded Perennial Holistic Wellness Center in Los Angeles. Um, It was the first licensed dispensary in my council district in Los Angeles in 2007. So, yeah, I'm basically a pioneer of the legalized industry. And I have. And so that and that took place during a fairly high profile series of raids, I think, enforcement. I remember seeing quite a bit about enforcement during that that time period. So can you can you give us a sense of of why you got into into the industry and also um, given the, the the risks associated with with it at the time? Sure, sure. I mean, so. I've always been an entrepreneur. It's always just been part of my blood. And uh, so at the time before I opened the dispensary, I was working as a fundraiser for nonprofits, progressive nonprofits, the DNC, Hillary, saving animals, the buildings, whatever. Um, my manager, who is also a good friend of mine, was uh, suffering with bipolar disease and was having a hard time managing it with the drugs that was being being prescribed to her. So as we ended up carpooling um, through our friendship and work relationship, I would I, every now and again on the way to work. Of course, I got high on the way to work. Um, <laughs> I'm fundraising for money. I mean, what do you you got to do? You have to. You have to be a little bit. Yeah, you're gonna get yelled at by a bunch of a bunch of mean people. Like, Why are you bothering me? I'm saving teddy bears. I mean, come on. Um, <laughs> no, but so the reality was, I, I I was eventually able to give her something. Like, well, just take a hit on the way to work. Don't get blasted. Just you know, find that space for yourself. And. It was a miracle to her to see it happen. It was just it changed her world entirely. So all of a sudden, her drugs made sense and her brain made sense, and she was able to find that balance of of, of uh, sanity, is the way she likes to call it. Um, and then watching her blossom from that, I, I feel like I created a monster because <laughs> like, literally almost every day she would go buy an eighth of a dispensary, right? Mm-hmm. And we would smoke every day together. So like, try this and try this, and it was fantastic. And I, what didn't take long before I realized, like if if you're just one customer, if I aggregated you out over all of Los Angeles, like, holy crap, this is a cash cow. 
Great um, market. It was a great market. So my best friend at the time said, we should open a dispensary. I'm like, that's a great idea. If you find a spot, I will quit my job. And he came back literally the next day. He said, I found a spot. So I quit my job. <laughs> <laughs> and we opened our dispensary. And uh, I opened it on Christmas Eve of 2006 because uh-huh. I had, I believe that the LA City Council would recognize like people are opening stores that sell marijuana. Hold, hold your horses. Everybody come back for emergency session. We've got to stop this. At, that didn't happen. It never happened. I, I, huh. I, you know, they dropped the ball and it, things move forward. But uh, not more being open, say, two weeks. I think of January 21st, the DEA came down raiding in person with their guns at drawn and everything else, mm-hmm. raiding every single dispensary on Ventura Boulevard. Uh, they hit 12 of 13 that they aimed to hit. We were the 13th, but we were so small. Stuck in an upstairs office, the sign out front of our store said Brazil Tours. So you knew what to expect. Sort of. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you never know what you never know how to expect something like that. Yeah. So we had to we closed our shop in 2007 because the DEA finally came after me and they're like, well, you're one of those vocal rabble rousers. You're on the internet talking about how people can do this legally. We've got to shut you up. Um, so they went after my landlord. Nice old mm-hmm. Jewish man, never had so much as a parking ticket. All of a sudden, the DOJ is sending him a letter saying, we're going to seize your building. You're in collusion with criminals. And blah, blah, blah. I'm like, oh, no. So uh, we went. I had a great relationship with the guy. I'm like, I'm yeah. not going to you know, risk your family business, everything else. Like, I'll move. Just let me let me get through the licensing process in the next 30 days, and I'll, I'll go quietly. And that's what happened. I was able to get my golden ticket from the city that I existed at that time and go underground for a little bit and then reestablish in, the, in Studio City just down the street from where I was. Um, and reopened shop again and became one of the first luxury shops in LA. Legal. Legal. Or, legal. Yeah. Okay, legal. license. Okay. Yeah. Okay. But cool. So at some point you came down to the San Diego region. Why why'd you leave Los Angeles? Oh, I was a member of the Greater Los Angeles Collective Alliance. And when you guys were developing the dispensary model here in San Diego, there was a political disconnect. It was very much the gangsters versus the politicians and the law enforcement. And then and, and the good people of the industry who are here medically, they're like, well, we're trying to provide based off state law. We're not part of this cartel system that's coming out of Mexico or anything else that people believe help us bridge that gap with politics. So that's what we did. We came down as a contingent from Los Angeles as part of GLACA down to San Diego to meet with the mayor, to meet with all these different people. And from there, I just I fell in love with the city. It's just it's fantastic. I moved down to Ocean Beach at some point, lived there for a while, and really got involved in the politics and whatnot. So here we are, Prop 64 passed. Um, recreational marijuana is legal. But I think something that a lot of people don't realize is how small the legal market still is right now and how kind of fragile it is. Um, so walk us through where we are right now in this moment in time. Um, who in the city is, of San Diego was allowed to get a retail license and why? Okay. Um, yeah, so in San Diego, there are, I believe, 14 dispensaries that are functioning right now. Uh, I think 18 have received their licenses. Four of them are still in the process of building out and doing what they need to do. Mm-hmm. Um so in 2010, there was a proliferation of dispensaries all over. You can find them all over the city. <laughs> and it was actually a partner in one of the very small ones out off of Market Street. Um, and uh, when they came down, cracking down, everybody sort of closed. The people who couldn't afford to stay open, they closed. They, they saw the right on the wall. Criminal action is going to be filed against you. Get out or you've been warned. You know, none of us wanted to have criminal records for just moving marijuana to sick people. So if you weren't really like in it to win it for like, the long haul, people closed their doors down here. A handful of them stayed open. As medical, right? As so medical, really correct. Really focusing on the medical. This market. is before Prop 64 even right. existed. We mm-hmm. had Prop 19 that had failed prior to this, and we had a whole bunch of other prop- legalization propositions that had failed prior to Prop 64. Uh, so this is all very much Prop 215, mm-hmm. uh, SB 420, the right. medical marijuana laws. So the people who were able to continue that the business were in a continuous fight with the with the city, but, you know, when you start dealing with that kind of a sensitive issue where the people want it, the money behind it is tremendous. And the political ladders that are sitting in front of the council then are still tremendously high. There was clearly a symbiotic relationship that could be made there. So the ones that have moved forward now, 
good for them. They've played the game properly. They they knew how to politic. They knew, or what I call like to call potlitic. Um, <laughs> good. Uh, and, and Love so, the pot it, puns. Right? Just, just to be clear, Sam, it was it was the medical facilities which were allowed to convert into recreational, right? Correct. You okay. had to be in existence as a medical before you can get your recreational, okay. I believe. Um, so they were able to do the lobbying and the, and the political shimmy and the dance that needed to be done. And now you have half dozen apothecaries in town. You have uh, the Urban Leafs and run by fantastic people who are very business acumen is just tremendous. So you know that they're going to be successful businesses. They have no reason to break the law and divert stuff. So like it's it's a win. Mm-hmm. The, the problem is, is that there's so few dispensaries and they're in such strange locations that it makes it very difficult for nobody in North County can get to a dispensary. None, none of the, if you're a paratransit person, for instance, Lyft doesn't get to any of the dispensaries. Right. Uh, you would have to wait for the next Lyft get to the location closest to it and then mm-hmm. wait for the next lift to come get you. So it's like a seven or eight hour trip just to go from say Oceanside to Point Loma and back. And and so just to be clear that the reason that is, is because the, there were certain zoning restrictions put in place, right? It was about a, like the, the, the businesses themselves, or I should say the outlets, cause they're not all businesses, but the outlets couldn't be within a thousand feet of what was designated as essentially like a special use facility. Correct. Right? You couldn't be around churches, anything that churches or daycares, anything that that uh, caters to children in the majority mm-hmm. of the time, yeah. any of the sensitive uses. Um, lots of things qualify. Parks, for instance, qualify. Beaches and all that fun jazz. Um, so you have you have dispensaries that are beautifully designed locations stuck in really dark, <laughs> Weird seedy <places>. locations. Yeah. <laughs> I have not been to one yet. Um, have both of you checked? I mean, we're curious. We're journalists, right? We're supposed to do this. I feel really bad about this. It was for research, right? <laughs> so, are these you really inhale, are these really nice, beautiful, <laughs> professional facilities? I mean, I, I'm from Colorado, so I've certainly been in a recreational um, dispensary, but I, I haven't been to one yet. So, so are yeah. they across the board? They're big. They're beautiful. What they're all in San Diego? They're all beautiful. The yeah. the what we have in Los Angeles, say with the pot shop. What are you think in your mind of the pot shop? You walk in at C's cage. You're gonna get robbed walking in. You get robbed walking out. And you're just like, oh my god, they do, that doesn't exist. That model just just simply doesn't exist. And with huh. recreational, that's open to anybody. There's no reason for a planning commission to allow for a CD location to open. This is right. now a calling card for your city. So when people from England fly here, like we bought marijuana for legal <laughs> in San Diego, what was it like? It was incredible the place was clean the people were nice everything needs to be something different it's still it's still a tourist calling card no matter how you look at it at this point and so of course this doesn't mean you know the the handful of legal shops this does not mean that there are no longer illegal or unpermitted cannabis dispensaries um they're all over the place i live by a lot of them i'm in the east county um so so is that simply because there's so few and it's just never going to meet the demand of the market, which is huge? It's a combination of things. So for San Diego, they're, they're only permitted the 14 that are functioning. Uh, they just raided one recently in Old Town that opened up without a permit, knowing full well they opened without a permit. And they're beautiful location. A lot of money went into That's it. That's a very central location. That's right. Bold. They figured people would turn blind eye and it wasn't the, they didn't feel that there was enough engagement from city council to raid people again and get involved in it but no the police are very much active in trying to make sure to to keep it clean and keep it legal the way it is Mm -hmm. so it seems like delivery services are the right compromise in this sense right sam because if if like the the theory has been from from at least the officials i've heard from is okay if you don't if you don't want a cannabis shop on main street Mm -hmm. but we still want to service people uh, who are sick, who can't possibly drive or get right. to their supplies. So why don't we allow some form of delivery services? But that was cut out of the supply chain ordinance, which was approved last September, I believe, right? Correct. Um, so walk us through why you think delivery services, I guess, are just sort of the most efficient way around this uh, tricky situation. The analogy I like to make is that from the moment the first marijuana plant was grown, there was somebody waiting on the other side for it to be delivered. <laughs> right out of the gate. The <laughs> delivery was the number one way to get product to the customer um moving forward it's not so much that we're we're looking for to have pot slingers just running around the city it's very much still a cannabis therapy practitioner kind of business where independent retailers have their core group of 30 50 or 100 patients that they know intimately sure they're they're the the ones who buy on the discounts and the coupons that they find or first time patient gifts and whatnot but the reality is, like I have, like in Carlsbad, for instance, I have 18 patients that are now disenfranchised from service because Carlsbad banned with a full ordinance any commercial activity in Carlsbad. 
it's a misdemeanor if you got caught. And if you got caught and you get convicted, then you're out of the loop entirely and it, it's not worth it for whatever small sale it's going to be. Mm-hmm. I mean, altruistically, 10 years ago, I would have said, screw you, police, I'm going to do it anyway because it was for the right cause. But now it, the industry is so sophisticated, they don't see it as the right cause anymore. It's just, you're now a, a rebel and they're well, going to put you in place. There are also repercussions, right? <clears throat> Couldn't they ban you from the legal marketplace if they caught you? Right, and that would be yeah. the big fear that 12, mm-hmm. 13 years of my life on the front of this industry would be just washed away because I'm trying to do something altruistic, which is not seen that way in the court of law. It's still very much, I broke the law. You were told what the law was, you broke the law, and too bad for you. And that's what I try to avoid. So, But delivery is definitely, definitively the key. Like, There's 2 million people that live in this county and there's only 13 stores technically allowed to deliver in San Diego City, um, whereas there are also you can deliver from outside of the city into the city as well. But there's so few of those yeah. that's almost a moot point as well. And and the state does have a license for independent drivers, right? You don't need to necessarily be attached to a retail shop. Correct. They offer a Type Nine delivery license, so you hmm. can be a a location that has a storage facility that's licensed that is the dispatch location for all the product to, to go from. And that's what I'm working on right now. I have a location out in the desert that I'm finalizing my Type 9 license on. Hmm. Doesn't it Doesn't it seem, to play devil's advocate with you, Sam, doesn't it seem safe and reasonable to just give the retail shops the ability to make house calls rather than go through the hoops of regulating independent shops? Uh, or independent sh- drivers, I should say? Sure, to some degree. I mean, it, it it makes it simpler to to regulate this, the, or the industry. You know... 13 stores. Like if you got pulled over right now doing a delivery, you have a manifest and some sort of identification that associates each one of those dispensaries and the police know. Hmm. Um, and that's where the breakdown is. So if, if you're making a delivery and you're not on that list, it's you're right away taken away. So yeah, it makes it makes it very simple for the police to do the to do their job. But then again, you also have people who don't want to deal with dispensaries. They have never dealt with a dispensary before. They've always dealt with me or somebody else, and I know what this person wants. I know that even the smallest percentage of CBN will put this person into a tizzy or anything above 12% THC, and they might pass out. I, I know these things intimately like a pharmacist knows their patients. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is kind of this is the kind of anecdotal information that drop and flash delivery service people or anic- uh, ancillary delivery services from the dispensaries just don't do. It's It's a volume business for them. They need to make at least four to five deliveries an hour to make it worth their while for a driver. That doesn't give any time for for any consultation or any sort of therapy. So, you know, this is one of perhaps several issues that people have against the city of San Diego's ordinance regulating the supply chain of marijuana here. Um, You know, is it, are you here, are you feeling like they're just putting their toes in the water and they're going to make adjustments and figure these things out and fix it? Or sort of what is your sense since you're, you're actively lobbying the city council to, to change these rules, right? Yeah. So uh, the retail ordinance that came through never allowed for delivery because the delivery system was still so scattered. There was, there weren't as, there wasn't a delivery lines two years ago. We're still very much a new organization. Uh, so when the first retail ordinance came together, as far as doing delivery, the operators of the dispensaries came to a conclu- asked flat out, "Well, what happens if we don't deliver do, do delivery ordinance at all?" And they were informed it would probably just by default fall onto the dispensaries and and dispensaries become de facto delivery services. Well, fantastic! There's no reason to rock that boat any further. If I were a dispensary operator, I'd be in the same position. So goodbye for that. Uh, so when that ordinance passed, it did not have delivery on it, and it was there was never enough time to lobby to get anything put into it. The new, the second ordinance that came out was for the balance of the industry, for manufacturing, mm-hmm. for cultivation, for distribution, uh, lab testing. Again, they left out the delivery component. Uh, I, I have certain personal feelings as to why that was happening. I feel that there was, you know, I feel like within the industry, there are people who are heavily invested in this business and they know that any competition, even a small one person delivery service is another piece of their bottom line that they're not going to achieve in a particular time period because they're stuck on a five-year time period before they can renew their licenses. I, I was cautioned very early on this beat, which I started just a couple of months ago, that that you should that one shouldn't speak of the industry as though it's this like cohesive single thing, right? There are Correct. various factions and various various elements. So um, retail has a financial incentive, right, to keep you guys out of this. Absolutely. Yeah. 
Yeah, I mean, like if you look at, for instance, Urban Leaf, they've teamed up with the uh, platform service called Ease, which prides itself on deliveries in under 45 minutes. So now uh, Urban Leaf is going, yeah, it's it's a great service. And I think that's, if I can get that, if I can get that from a dealer 10 years ago, oh my God, that'd be the <laughs> coolest thing. Uh, but today, that's what people want. They're here, they want it now, they want immediate gratification, and they're able to do that. They went from having two or three delivery drivers, and now they have 131 delivery drivers all across scattered around the city. Mm-hmm. Uh, whereas, say, like uh, other places like a Green Alternative don't have any delivery service. It's just not part of their mm-hmm. business plan, and I'm trying to team up with them once I get my license to say, yeah. well, we can work together. I have a legitimate license. You have a license. Let's put our efforts together because my delivery it doesn't isn't necessarily dispensary and vice versa. Mm-hmm. So there is some biotic relationships that can can be made in the future, but everybody's in it to win it for their own for their own thing right now. Like I've always explained that San Diego and the county itself is like an island. Anything south of the border checkpoints, p- things products just do not reach south of the border checkpoints. The the cannabis lifestyle that we live in San Francisco, Sacramento, Los Angeles, and Orange County is not similar to what it is in San Diego. Mm-hmm. San Diego's all has to create its own industry mm-hmm. it has to have its own cultivation it has to have its own manufacturing yeah. and, and have its own, own, its own you know san diego san diego it has to have its own little kitschy thing but uh without a cohesive co- uh, ordinance that covers everything san diego's there's no way it can survive and it's too small right now to survive so just like the illegal dispensaries keep popping up Obviously, there are people who, you know, you said you're not willing to break the law, but there are delivery services that exist um, that are still doing it regardless of having a license or being teamed up with one of the um, the legal dispensaries here. And I actually <laughs> I have a funny story. I uh, took a phone number from a press release of a local political candidate, oh, yeah. and it was a typo. And I called and it actually ended up being a medical marijuana delivery person. Ah. (laughs) And man, he was a salesman. (laughs) He was like, oh, wrong number? Well, that's okay. Would you like me to bring you some marijuana right now? I'll give you a deal. And I was just, I was kind of, it was hilarious. But I was sort of just surprised at how um, aggressively he wanted me to become a customer. So is that because of what's going on here or like... I'm sure everybody's in a desperate state at this point. Really? Yeah. Um, the, the delivery services that are operating still, though, they're still operating in compliance under a very thin rule of the Compassionate Use Act, hmm. which is still in effect. So it's only medical? Yeah, still okay. only medical, still part of a closed circuit, but that all expires, I believe, January 19th or 9th of 2019. So it's a very short lived thing. None of the, nobody's really banking on it as something that they can continue their business on. It's more of one of, this is your opportunity to close out business and still have a legal standing and do what you need to do, either partner or do what you have to do. You don't have, it's not an immediate shut off of your business. We're going to give you the Compassionate Use Act. Hmm. But a lot of people are still dragging their feet and saying, oh, no, I have this for another year. I'm going to continue working and making money. But enforcement's going to come sooner than later. And the Compassionate Use Act is going to lose its value sooner than later. Interesting. Yeah. I mean, I see the need. I have a family member who is 97, uh, had some trouble sleeping mm-hmm. and he tried, um, just the oil. So just the CBD oil yeah. as an ointment, um, that he rubs, I think on his chest. Okay. And it was like a miracle. And that I, helped him sleep? It helps him sleep for some reason. Uh, awesome. Yeah. I don't, I mean, so I don't know. I haven't looked at it. I should probably actually see what he's doing, but whatever it was, it's been amazing. And you know, his caretaker, um, because a lot of people don't know whether a, a dispensary is legal or not legal, right. right? That's kind of difficult to figure out. Um, well, I guess you could Google it, but anyway, um, so he <laughs> keeps going, you know, keeps having to find new resources sure. and, um, you know, just hooking up the 97 year old who can't drive at this point, obviously right. with a nice, you know, stable delivery would be, I mean, I oh, get absolutely. it. I see the need. You, you bring up a good point with a caregiver too. Um, one of my biggest issues is, and the biggest rebuttal I hear from city councils is that, well, the caregivers can go to the dispensary and pick up this marijuana for these people. At that point, you're forcing somebody to possibly go against their own moral code to go do something. Being somebody's nurse and their caregiver is one thing, but going to a, what they might consider a drug boutique and having to purchase something that goes against the grain, right. that shouldn't be part mandated against them because their their customer or their patient is a medical marijuana, chooses to use medical marijuana. Mm-hmm. The, the other interesting thing I should say, and, and this kind of touched on what you just mentioned a second ago, Kinsey, um, uh, Chris Kate, city council member, um, highlighted 
uh, weed maps a couple mm-hmm. weeks ago in a letter to the city attorney's office saying uh, you should take stronger enforcement measures against these online platforms, right? And my understanding is that the city attorney's office sort of balked at that, at least for the time being, has no interest in going and trying to prosecute an online platform. But a company like Weed Maps doesn't distinguish between legal and illegal operations. What did, what did you make of that whole feud? Uh, I've short-lived? actually had a, a number of good meetings with Chris Kate personally. I like Chris Kate, yeah. even though he's, for the most part, against what we're doing. He sees the future of it coming together. He sees that regulation is the key to to maximizing the tax revenue for the city. Uh, he doesn't like the weed maps thing because he feels that it's that people are subverting the law by using weed maps. It's no longer become a, an asset for how do patients get their medicine. It's become a almost like a coupon book. Who has the cheapest deal and who can get me the most product for the least price? It's, there's nothing medical about it. And the continued advertising on weed maps just sort of makes it, it makes regulation difficult. If people are supposed to be out of compliance, if you allow people to advertise it, and that's the the source for the black market to do their business, then so be it. Like Leafly, for instance, the competitor to weed maps, as of March 1st, you can't advertise on Leafly unless you have a business license from the state. Oh, interesting. Right. So mm-hmm. they're being very proactive about it. So they're, they like to lead by example, which is what more industry people need to do. Should we talk about the South Bay really quickly? Sure. So Chula Vista is working on its own ordinance right now, which would include or it has the potential for deliverers to apply for a license, right? Yes. Can you walk us through that? Yeah. So I actually had a long meeting today before I came here about Chula Vista. Um, we're meeting with their city council members and some of their planners and hopefully the mayor next week as well before the February 20th event. Um, they, on February 20th is when they're voting for an ordinance to do all to, to regulate the industry. Uh, so the fight right now is that there's they're doing uh, three or sorry is it yeah three uh, licenses per, per district. district yeah but there are only four districts and only four districts right. allowing for twelve total licenses um, the permitting process for deliveries is going to be just administrative only whereas the dispensaries have to go through a CUP so right out of the gate we're in conflict and that's not something hmm. that we want uh, does every city need dispensaries not necessarily. But this is one of the situations where they recognize that the dispensaries are great tax revenue sources, uh, whereas a delivery service could be very scattered and, and tourists that are coming into San Diego don't necessarily want to have a delivery service come to them. They want the experience of going to a brick-and-mortar store. Mm-hmm. So out of the gate, the dispensaries are hamstrung, which is unfair. And I'm a dispens- delivery operator. I've been a dispensary operator. I, I see it from both sides. Uh, what I think needs to happen is that the licensing needs to be for retail needs to be delineated to the dispensaries. Allow for, say, if twelve would be great. Uh, the reality is, you need probably one dispensary for every fifty thousand people. So if you can factor in the tourism levels, so maybe twelve is about the right number for of dis- brick and mortar dispensaries for Chula Vista. One impact or one concern from residents for not only delivery services but um, dispensaries is the all cash factor right. and the crime that is revolves around that um, not too long ago there was a robbery of, of a delivery guy i think in stockton um who had a bunch of cash on him and mm-hmm. so so sort of the violent gun related crime that revolves around maybe robberies for look people looking for all that cash so sure. what do you say to those concerns i mean i can speak to it on a personal note because i was actually robbed and held hostage in my dispensary oh. Whoa. <laughs> yeah <Fun. okay. laughs> towards the end of my time there um but i've since day one i always took credit cards and i always dealt with a high value customer so it was never for me it was never a big issue i, huh. I walk into a bank wow. who are you what do you do this is what i do who you are okay great here's your bank account have a good day really no i don't look like you can't see me on the show but i don't look like a thug <laughs> i don't act like a thug i, I feel that i'm well spoken to some degree and I, I don't give pause to a banker to go you might be involved in criminal activity let me let me not give you an account i just i don't, I don't fall into that profile if you will so i've always had credit card processing so when i got robbed there was no cash in the place anyway it was like maybe 1500 bucks that's everything with literally almost all of our business was on credit cards yeah, so imagine you've got this situation where people are walking around with what ten, twenty thousand dollars worth of cash, and they sure. got to go put it into an ATM and one twenty dollar bill at a time. It's right. like it just it just seems that that policy is set up to fail. Oh, for sure. I mean, the best example of this would be in San Francisco. One of the dispensaries there had to pay their tax bill, and they're all cash business, so they took a duffel bag with four hundred thousand dollars in cash to the tax assessor in San Francisco to pay their bill. Wow, no big deal. San Francisco is a small place, two mile walk, no big deal. 
they were re- they were rebuffed by the the San Francisco assessor saying we can't take cash here at this mm-hmm. office. You need to go to the Oakland location. So these people walked onto the BART with a duffel <laughs> bag with four hundred grand oh in cash gosh. and went to Oakland and walked through Oakland to the tax assessor. I would and, just have a heart attack at that. <laughs> right. So that's the extreme. Um, the reality is a lot of these places now have bank accounts. Uh, there's okay. a big push for a credit union from the state to allow for the money. A lot of credit unions are quietly accepting this money, knowing that it's no longer black market and it's sophisticated people. Uh, Don't tell Jeff Sessions that. <laughs> you can edit this part out, right? <laughs> so, are you, so are you saying that anyone who gets properly licensed should be able to start a delivery service? Uh yeah, I mean, if you can find a city that allows for delivery, sure. That's you have to get a. If you can find a city that's licensing delivery services, absolutely go. But you for don't. It. Th- there should be any sort of caps. Not necessarily. You let the market decide. Yeah, let the market decide. Because so again, a lot of these things are survival are, of the fittest. <laughs> and there's going to be that. There's going to there's going to be those those eagles that want to be the dominoes the domino system. They want to have delivery under 20 minutes. Once you pick it, it should be at your door with a drone. Like they want that. <laughs> Um, the reality is the majority of us are cannabis therapy practitioners, and we have our basis of like 50 to 100 people. All we need is a 400-square-foot warehouse to hold maybe $5,000 worth of product for any given day. Um, and with the number of distributors that are out there, we can keep our rotation very fresh and very and always going. It's not like a dispensary needs to have $100,000 of product on display to give you that visual wow. It's, it's a warehouse. It's an office. You, you know what you want. My website tells you what I have. Um, and that's what we really need to have. We need to be able to maintain that continuity of service. Okay. But so I have to rep <clears throat> the East County here for a second. Sure. Um, and I believe it was, I don't know if you were involved in this, but um, Again. advocates from the you know cannabis industry successfully put uh, ballot measures in um, for medical marijuana dispensaries in La Mesa and Lemon Grove. They both yes. passed. Yes. <clears throat> so those are happening. I think there's a meeting happening in uh, tonight in La Mesa where they'll finally get the ball rolling. It's been a slow process. I don't think any medical dispensaries are open in either city yet. But La Mesa is very clear to shut everything down and start from a clean slate. Okay, so they started from a clean slate. But um, so is that sort of forcing politicians to to do something about it? I mean, like either you guys, you know, even in the North County, do you feel like that's what's going to happen is, you know, if they, if the city council doesn't regulate, then it'll, what happened in La Mesa and Lemon Grove will happen and it'll be a ballot measure and the people will vote on it. And um, as we've seen in Lemon Grove, because um, I'm not saying, so the ballot measures were written away where there's some problems, right? Sure. <laughs> so I'm actually the citizen proponent of the Oceanside ballot measure. Okay, okay. So, I mean, it's not easy writing these things. Not and uh, it's probably, I don't know, is, isn't it best if the city council gets out ahead of this instead of turning it into ballot box kind oh, of and legislating and policy making? Sure. At any point that a city council can regulate its own city and not have outside interference, the city is going to be in a better place. Uh, some people have to be brought to the to the voting booth kicking and screaming. Like even though 60 some odd percent of voters wanted recreational legalized marijuana, these politicians are still holding their conservative hat saying, no, I think better for you. You voted for me and I think I should think for you. And that, that's mm-hmm. not what being voted into office means. You're supposed to represent us, not think for us. Yeah, or, or they say Prop 64 gave us the option to either approve or disapprove of marijuana so we're taking the option to disapprove of it we're doing nothing wrong right exactly and that's also going against the grain it doesn't matter how many people show up to to oppose that and the the deferment is always well what about the children we need to protect us from the children and thank god for the internet because now the news is coming out well what about the children where are they getting the marijuana from Uh, their parents are giving it to them they're stealing it themselves from the parent it's always coming from the parents or the big brother or the sister or whoever else it's not the diversion is not happening at the sales level and that's the best thing that could that's the best news i've had all year okay well we should wrap it up just but maybe before we do we should talk about 2018 political races yes let's um uh, uh, let's get your sense sam on where do you think in 2018 cannabis will be an issue politically and which races and how might it affect some of the some of the political races um it's a, definitely a hot button issue for a lot of people if they're the people who are anti say the bonnie the manises of the world uh, they have their core supporters and they're trying to not bring up marijuana at all because it shines poorly on them when they speak negatively of it. Uh, overall, it's it's a great fundraising tool because they recognize that the cannabis industry as a whole has a lot of money behind it to get things done. 
Um, but a lot of the progressive uh, candidates are, are, have come to terms with it. The public wants this. What we need to do is regulate it properly. There's a lot of money to be had. We can eliminate the black market if we regulate this properly. Um, so I think people like Genevieve Jones-Wright, I think should be a wonderful uh, DA. I think Dave Myers for sheriff would be, is going to be awesome. I think Jerry Kern, even though I'm not a Republican, I think Jerry Kern from Oceanside would be a fantastic supervisor person, as well as Nathan Fletcher. Um, so it's going to be a really neat ca- neat candidacy. I think the big turning point will be 2020. I think once 2018 comes and people have marijuana businesses and they see the money's coming and it's not this crazy thing, uh, it, the tides will turn. And it's a presidential year, so. Right, which makes people. fundraising for any sort of election thing very expensive, too. So people got to be very careful what they want to do. All right. Well, thank you so much for coming in, Sam. It's yeah, such a pleasure so. to be here. Thanks, guys. Before we go, we want to check in with our friend and photojournalist, Vito Di Stefano, the Andy Rooney of San Diego Cannabis. Stay tuned for that. So we're joined by Vito. What's up, man? How are you? Hey, now. He's going to give us his uh, his puff pieces of the week. These are the strange tales from the world of Potlandia. Is that correct, Vito? That is correct. And uh, why don't you take it away? Well, first, I just wanted to wish you both a happy Valentine's Day, as we are uh, taping on Valentine's Aww. Day. And now, Kinsey, I know you're married, <laughs> but can it be your podcast Valentine? You may. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Because I know we'd be great together. <laughs> it's been working on this for days. Days and minutes. <laughs> so, um, I thought we would start with some California cannabis news. But first, let me ask you a question. Sure. What would you expect no. to find, see, or do at a Willy Wonka factory of weed? Definitely lick something, okay. right, that tasted like marijuana. Well, in Mendocino County, California, a cannabis brand called Flo Canna just bought an 80-acre winery, and it is being called the Wonka Factory for Weed. Wow. Nice. Yes. They plan to become the world's premier education resource and central processing center, a virtual Wonka factory for weed. Now, from the website, they state, just as a small coffee farmer brings coffee beans to a centralized facility, facility to be dried, roasted, processed, or packaged at scale, the Flow Cannabis Institute will provide a centralized location for small independent cannabis farmers to test, dry, cure, trim, process, package, manufacture, distribute um, the harvest at a massive scale. Hmm. They essentially want to create a counter to big weed for local farmers in their community in Humboldt County and Mendocino. Uh, so they don't get pushed out of the market. So wait, with this, and people could go visit this and see this all happening. Yes. Hey, okay. Now it's on an eighty-acre parcel of land, which used to be a former winery. So they eventually want to have a bud and breakfast. Nice, <laughs> of course. A cannabis spa. Okay. Event center, you know, to hold weed weddings and such. Oh yes. And they also plan to bring back an old 1920 saloon back from a uh, from disrepair. Oh, so you can have the cute little bud tenders with their little bow ties and their. I mean, whatever you're into. Weed cufflinks. Wait, wait, wait. So, so who's Marijuana the Wonka in this equation? Is there, is there well, like a guy? Well, the, the the institute. Well, that's <laughs> the thing. I, th- I I describe it as a misnomer. Really, I mean, a Wonka factory for me would be you know a huge edible factory with giant edible mushrooms. Lazy chocolate cannabis rivers, <laughs> rolling hills of Oompa Loompa Kush, as far as the eyes can see. <laughs> I mean, that's just how I would envision a Wonka factory. Oh, any cannabis VCs out there listening? Uh, Vito's your guy. <laughs> He's got that just, a, that just sounded idea. like your resume, by the way. <laughs> so that is kind of the local California news. Okay, you now, got something else for us? On to international news. Um, with the Pyeongchang Winter Olympics in full swing, the world's potlight is focused on the Korean Peninsula. Oh, We're the worst. <laughs> now, would you believe if I told you North Korea is a stoner's paradise? I would not believe that. No, nope, not buying it. Neither would I. However, the British newspaper The Telegraph named it as one of the nine destinations to smoke cannabis legally in 2017. Huh. 
Now, there's a lot of hype from this from somewhat reputable news outlets like High Times, Vice, Mary Jane, Green Rush, and Radio Free Asia. They have uh, run with news stories that it is legal, abundant, and popular with North Koreans and Chinese tourists. Now, is this just fake news perpetrated by the cannabis propaganda machine? Or a real underground movement in North Korea? Now, it's pretty hard to figure that out as foreigners' access is restricted. Now, after going down a little pothole <laughs> of research, it seems the origins of the hype came from two main stories in 2013. The first is from a UK citizen, Damon Richter, who described his experiences of smoking weed in North Korea on his blog during a tour. Uh, he was on a tour with, and he visited some special markets and bought green, not brown, plant matter and went on to describe rolling joints and smoking them throughout his tour. Hmm. Um, the second comes from Radio Free Asia news outlet, which is U a U.S.-supported news service, by the way. And they reported, also in 2013, that Chinese tourists buy up large quantities of cannabis from local markets near the border. So these Chinese tourists come in and they get dirt cheap weed, basically. So basically from those two stories, all these other news outlets are basically taking those two stories and... Running wild. Uh, yes. So, so do we suspect that it's maybe embellished? Well, now, there are conflicting reports to this. Uh, the Associated Press debunked the question that cannabis is legal in North Korea. It most certainly is not legal. Um, the AP quotes, the penal code lists it as a controlled substance in the same category as cocaine and heroin. So what is really going on here? Now, we have two probable explanations. Um, that people are confusing the plants with hemp, which is allowed by the North Korean government. Um, but is no fun to smoke. No. <laughs> Not at all. Wait, that's, a, that's a story I want to hear a different time. <laughs> um, they use hemp in North Korea. Um, it's actually allowed and encouraged by the North Korean government for consumer goods, towels, cooking oil, noodles, military uniforms, and rabbit fodder, which they feed the rabbits and then eat them. Hmm. Um, the other explanation is that it's just a mix of brown and greenish leafy tobacco that is popular and smoked openly in Pyongyang and elsewhere. So what to believe? I don't know. But after spending minutes and minutes on this report, <laughs> I think I may have a simple and plausible solution to this vexing question. I think it's obvious and possibly staring us right in the face. Would you like to hear it? Absolutely. Yeah, man. <laughs> okay. We send Jesse by boat to North Korea immediately. Oh, God. Have him go undercover, perhaps with a disguise, maybe some chin putty, some false teeth, <laughs> maybe even monocle. I mean, whatever you're most comfortable with, Jesse. <laughs> None of the above. <laughs> and have you, report, have you report your findings from deep, deep inside the North Korean hillside and markets. Kind of like a 21st century James Bong. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, why me? Why don't you go? You're a much better reporter oh, than I. Thank you. Jesse. <laughs> the name is Bong. Jesse Bong. Oh my God. Double O four twenty. Well, that so, was enlightening. Yes. Indeed. I Thank you. I feel much more high minded now that you oh, have provided us with such fantastic information. Thank yes. you, Vito. One last thing I would like to ask all the listeners in Paulandia. Please feel free to send any and all weed puns to the voice of San Diego. <laughs> And I will do, do my best to keep it real. Wait, did you just call his voice of sound Diego? <laughs> <laughs> we can't. Wait, no, Vito, we... are you stoned right now? <laughs> I how, wish. How high are you? <laughs> just trying to keep it real. And I will THC you later. Later, man. Thanks for coming in. Thank you. Thank you.